Hi, my name is Susie. I'm an activist and a journalist from Auckland, New Zealand. For years I've worked on controversial issues like the corruption of our intelligence agencies. I was severely targeted as a result of my work. This led to my articles being amplified by the world's most accomplished publisher. In 2016, I made a documentary about how and why I was forced to leave my country. I have now sought refuge in Russia and my situation has become public. Together with my best friend Ksenia, I want to show you what life is really like in Moscow. The most unlikely TV hosts. Okay, you have to you have to copy me, okay? Здравствуйте. Добрый вечер. What is it? Здравствуйте. 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 Всем привет. Я здесь на площади революции с моей лучшей подругой. Да. Ксенией Терентьевой. From MoscowMe.com. We're going to show you around Moscow. We want you to see the real Russia. This is the first time we're filming something in our life, so please don't judge us. So we are on Revolution Square. We are next to the Metropole Hotel, the most famous and luxurious hotel of Moscow. What it makes right? it so famous, Ksenia? Uh, well, Metropole Hotel uh, was built in the 19th century uh, in Art Nouveau style or modern style. After the revolution of 1917, it became the headquarters of the monarchy. So Moscow was the center of resistance against the communism in the, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. So that's why the square was called the Revolution Square because the bloodiest battles of the revolution took place here during six days. At the facade of the Metropole Hotel, still it's written a quote of Lenin. Only the dictatorship of the proletariat is able to liberate the humanity from the burden of the capital, Vladimir Lenin. It's written on the facade of the most fashionable hotel of Moscow, the Metropole Hotel. Senior, here we are at the Bolshoi Theatre. Um, I think a lot of Westerners know this place. I even had heard of it well before I ever came to Russia. Why is this so significant? Well, it has become Bolshoi Theatre has become famous all over the world as the symbol of not only of Moscow but of the whole Russia. Is the one of the most famous theatres of opera and ballet in the world? Well, Bolshoi. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, uh, if you have any clue, but Bolshoi in Russians means big so it's the big theater uh, well the big theater was built in the 19th century and uh, it was called the big imperial theater it belonged to the uh, empress of the russian empire uh, now the big theater is decorated with the symbol of the russian empire is the double-headed eagle now it's the symbol of the russian federation as well though after the revolution it was replaced by the hammer and the sickle the symbols of the soviet union the hammer stands for the worker and the sickle stands for the peasant but the bolshoi theater as we can see it now is not the original bolshoi theater right yeah well the original one was built uh, in 1776 and it was called Petrovsky Theater, so that's why the street we are going to is called Petrovka as well. <laughs> but it was burned down several times. One uh, of them was in 1812 uh, during the war against Napoleon. Wow. So, Ksenia, yes. a lot of people think that Russia is like undeveloped country, you know, all woods and bears. You hear horror stories about it being like really unsafe or millions of homeless people everywhere or um, like one of my family members said to me you're going to join the mafia when you come to <laughs> Russia 
<laughs> Which you makes me laugh. The mafia? Because, no, I have not joined the mafia. So. But it makes me laugh because the city is so beautiful and it's so well developed. This street is kind of the symbol of Russian commerce. This is Sum, one of the biggest, most beautiful shopping centers in Moscow. So you see the um, uh, making Moscow beautiful for the Easter. The Easter is coming, it's going to be here on the 16th of April. So the whole city is decorated with the Easter eggs and little Easter fair. And that last relief is called the Walker. It was installed there in 1921. Within the frames of the huge, massive socialist propaganda. But the ideas of this best relief are actually very beautiful, very clever. Like, the first thing you will see that the worker is depicted naked. Usually nobody goes to work naked, right? The idea was to show the body of working people. The idea is that if you are involved in the physical labor, your body is beautiful. And since we are the nation of working people, we are beautiful people. <laughs> so you shouldn't be actually ashamed of the fact that you are a worker, because it's a very respected job as well. And the other thing is that the worker is thinking he is thinking as, the, as if he was an antique like character, antique Greek or uh, Roman god. So Susie, where are we going now? We are heading towards Love Kalavka. What is Love Kalavka? Love Kalavka is one of my favorite places. Um, it's a favorite place of a lot of expats in Moscow. It is a restaurant, a gourmet, absolutely incredible restaurant. But more than a restaurant, it's a cooperative society. So. The uh, people who work there actually have a stake in the business and they source all of their products and foodstuffs from organic farmers across Russia. Yeah, they try to support national national economy. And the restaurant is so popular and so well known and so successful that well, actually the farmers who supply the restaurant have become quite famous and their names have become very well known for supplying the different types of foods that they have there. It's also beloved by Russians because it is 100% uh, organic pure food and also it is typical Russian kitchen but slightly modernized. Why is there a street shop? Um, I don't know. Something it's will like be all of these. held here or some has. There's a president or something. President, yeah. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are we allowed to film it? <laughs> come, come. No? Yes, yes. Yeah. Must be Mr. President Putin coming to his working place, which is the Kremlin. I think it's here. What unbelievable timing yeah. for the streets to be closed. Lucky you are. Big deal, the whole street was shut for you. So, here we have the Marriott. So, really, there's American uh, businesses and American buildings all we over. Have dozens Moscow. of Marriott's here in Moscow. Another thing I love about Moscow is that it's a 24 hour city. Oh, there yeah. are so many restaurants, bars, you supermarkets. You get your nails done to a hours a day. Everything that you need is well, available 24 hours a day. Yeah. We're getting closer to our destination, Lavka Lavka restaurant, which I think you will love totally. And we hope to interview the founder and the owner of Lavka Lavka, <laughs> Mr. Who created this club. So Lavka Lavka also has a, re it's a restaurant, but it also has a grocery store. Ah, where you can buy organic food. Exactly, and you can buy the exact products that they have, that they serve in, inside the restaurant. Actually, I'm not sure we use GMOs in Russia at all. No, GMOs is banned here. It's they, one of the best they, things. So actually, all our food is organic. That was produced in Russia, at least. Moxina, here we are inside Love Kalavka. Finally, we are. Eating the most incredible food. You guys have got to check this out. This is Kamchatka crab, right? My favorite food. It's called, um, it's called homemade but with dumplings with ricotta from Giuseppe Pellicoro, mm -hmm. Moscow region with king crab sauce and cream from Nina Kozlova, buckwheat from Pavel Abramov, king crab from Evgeny Romanov. They are all farmers who produce these products. My turn. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> I'm happy. 
thing. <laughs> oh my god, I love it. Time of my life. <laughs> Senior, tell me, tell me about our incredible salad. The salad is smoked and baked beetroot from Natalia Pashkevich with farm ricotta, sorrel pesto, spinach and fragrant oil. This is beet, uh, one of the most famous popular food in Russia. <laughs> Again, we are trying black pasta with the far east squid from Denise Rosenberg and Potarga from Ruslan Zeltenko. <laughs> <laughs> It's the first time for everything. Now that we have our bag of goodies from Lapka Lapka, we've walked up Petrovka and discovered the Museum of Modern Arts. Take a look. All of the saga. I bet you know who it is. This is Kazimir Malevich and his famous masterpiece, The Black Square. and political repression in the Soviet Union. Yeah, the, the memory of victims of oppression. So that's where the repression of the Soviet Union is actually exposed. There are a lot of memorials to the victims of the political repression of Stalin all, all around the city. We are also in front of a monastery, Mend Monastery. All around Moscow you will see these nice golden cupolas that are called onion cupolas. That means it's a church, a cathedral, a monastery or something like that. Uh, golden domes represent the candle flame. Hi, we're back! At Lovka Lovka. So now we are going to interview Boris Akimov the owner and the founder of Lavka Lavka. This very famous Moscow cooperative. Stay, Stay tuned. tuned. <laughs> Lavka 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 is uh, more than just a business. It's a, a farmer's cooperative and uh, we are all in this uh, Lavka Lavka, we all feel 
a little bit like a uh, big family. So we every day we feel excited about what we do. We travel across the country uh, to find interesting food, to find the people who are producing this interesting food. It's a way of life, I think. We never had the experience before the Love Plavka in the business. I worked, I worked as a journalist and my friend was an IT director. So we just had a great feeling, a great passion about the food, about the quality, healthy, local food. Before the Lavka Lavka, we didn't have an experience in the business. And we never um, uh, deal with the uh, with the food as, a, as a something that uh, uh, more than just something to eat every day. So uh, th that's why we uh, didn't know uh, the real problems we will have, and uh, uh, maybe that's why we decided to do it because because all the people who worked in this sphere and they all were saying that. It's not possible, you wouldn't do it. But we didn't believe them <laughs> because we, we, we weren't professionals. professionals. So that's why we decided to do it, decided to make, make something which we didn't have any idea about. Uh, maybe that's the reason why we did it. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Part of the welcoming family atmosphere at Lavka Lavka is the children's playroom, where children of patrons of the restaurant can come and play with a whole variety of toys in the most absolutely beautiful environment. The kids' room even has supervision with teachers who sit and play with the children. Is it all right or am I too sunshiny? No, nah, that's sweet. <laughs> or golden. It's funny yeah, too. I, um, I haven't had someone doing my hair and makeup either, but I think, I think we're all good. Me neither. I'm doing the like Kiwi chick no makeup hair and a ponytail look. I think it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Rich. Um, Hello. <laughs> as you know, it's pretty special for me to get to talk to you. Because you're from Occupy Wellington back in the day, and mm -hmm. I was from Occupy Auckland. So I feel very much like you're my compatriot in the struggle. So I'm just really keen to know, for us, Lumio is like a really big success story. You know, Occupy has been and gone, but you guys are still around, and what you're doing is still relevant and still really important. So I want to know, though, how Occupy impacted you. Um, what effect it had on you, what you learned there, and um, mm -hmm. how it served you in creating Lumio. Basically, my my experience of Occupy was um, my my life turned a major corner at that point. Like it just it really changed something about my identity and um, gave me a sense of purpose and community and um, analysis that I just didn't have before. You know, I just attribute that to the. Um, process of sitting in a circle and making decisions collectively like not having someone in charge that's got all of the answers but um, learning to listen to each other and hear from all the different perspectives and um, grow shared understanding from all of the different points of view within the group um, that I just never done that before and um, it really yeah it really inspired me I was like well we can you know on the one hand there's this um anxiety and terror that um some of the faces some of the crises crises we face are like you know they're like species level threats um and how the hell are we ever going to design our way out of these problems but then to participate in a um a collective intelligence process where it's like oh wow when we work together we can actually achieve like really incredible creative powerful um empathetic you know we can be superhumans when we work together um, I guess the impetus or the provocation for us to, to get to work on Lumio was surely we can capture some of the 
inspiration and the joy and the power of collective decision making um, and bypass some of the frustrations of doing it in person. We say we collapsed into legitimacy. We, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, started, started employing people and, and having to look for funding and all this sort of stuff turned into our real job and that was um, five years ago when we are still hard at work trying to make the thing work. Blue Mirror was the first tech cooperative that I've ever heard of in a New Zealand context. Um, what are the key points of difference between a traditional IT company um, and a tech, a cooperative tech enterprise, um, both in terms of your vision for Lumio, but also in the way that it organizationally functions? What, one of the uh, distinctive things about our co-op is that it's a worker-owned cooperative, so that means all the people um, that work, they are the ultimate decision makers, they own the thing. Um, there's no there's, there's no equity, so that's not like a financial ownership, but it's a, a governance ownership. Like we, um, you know, we've got advisors, we've got investors, we've got a board of directors, but the ultimate, um, the ultimate ownership res resides with the workers. So that means the, you know, as compared to a lot of other tech companies, we can't, we're never going to get sold out to some big Silicon Valley venture capitalist or something like that. Like, um, something that I watched of yours actually was the six, six concentric circles of ethical organizing video that you put on YouTube. It's been really influential for me personally because cool. in some of the projects that I'm working on this year, these are the types of topics that we're trying to broach, which is how do we really truly include everyone? Even when everybody truly believes in this flat, non-hierarchical structure, some people rise to the top and some people get pushed to the bottom, whether or not anyone intended that to occur. Um, and so those, those six concentric circles that you talk about actually provide really practical mechanisms by which you can counter that and which you can include everybody and make sure that no one's getting left behind. Um, and you talk about the practical way that you have applied that within Lumio. And I'm really hoping to see that uh, there are some other New Zealand organizations specifically that will hopefully get to mimic some of that um, in the future. And mm. I know that you've been working on something called Inspiral, which is like an incubator for um, cooperative enterprises. I was really interested to know like, what has come out, what cooperative enterprises have come out of Inspiral, um, what industries do they span, um, and in what ways do they differ from each other? Lumio is one example. Then you've got the Inspiral Developer Academy, um, both in Wellington and Auckland, which is a uh, um, it's like a boot camp for training programmers, um, and, it, and it, it's like um, a Trojan horse for teaching people about empathy and teamwork. Um, then you've got um, Action Station, so that's like a um, online progressive campaigning website, you know, like Move On or Avaz. Um, you've got Ability Mate in, in Australia, so they they 3D print prosthetic limbs at a fraction of the price you'd get them from um, a private hospital. Like, there's just yeah, like I say, like quite wow. a growing range of different um, organisations. And then you've got a lot of um, consultants, you know, like uh, management consultants, organisational design people, facilitators, like people that are really interested in in how we can work um, in non hierarchical ways. And they're they're kind of like activists inside organizations, I guess. Um, that seems to be a new theme that's coming through. So yeah, it's it's spreading out horizontally. And Lumio has spread around the world. Like it really is an international success story. What really do you attribute the success to? People look to us and they're inspired by, by the approach that we've taken. And, and I think the main factor is just that we've got um, an uncompromising commitment to our values. And um, People are refreshed by that. We're open source, so that means the product is, you know, it's like a public resource. It's not owned by some fat cats. And, yep, we're a worker-owned cooperative, which means there's no structural hierarchy. Yeah, we've prioritized um, our values over profit maximization. I think people are just hungry for something different, like an increasing number of people appreciate that the status quo is not really working for us as a species. Um, and, and they look to companies like us for, yeah, a, a, a hopeful alternative. The capitalist system has profoundly let us down because we see everybody's lives are not improving. As the profits soar, people, the quality of people's life degrades. And what I want to know is how viable 
and necessary is a cooperative revolution in business in New Zealand? In what ways can they contribute to the economic national interest? In a longer term view and, you know, taking into account quality of life, it is a really resilient structure. And, you know, there's like more than a billion people that are involved in the cooperative economy. Like it's not, it's not just this um, little fringe thing. Um, involving more stakeholders in the governance of companies tends to make them more equitable. On like day one, two, three, four, five of Occupy, it really felt like the new world is here. It has arrived. We have done it. We have all come together. We're going to solve every problem. And of course, as the pushback from the powers that be and the, the real rulers of this planet came down on our heads, we realized that the fight was unfortunately a lot bigger than just whether or not we could feed or, or clothe or house ourselves in the short term. But cooperative societies seem to promote like a self-sufficiency um, that is somewhat in line with that thinking of Occupy, which is that we don't need to be dependent upon the government if we make good decisions together ourselves and work collaboratively and look after each other, that we can provide for ourselves. So if we can lessen the burden on government, that should be a really good thing. Um, so what I would like to know is in what ways can government act or serve to strengthen cooperative societies? Um, what initiatives would you like to see in place? In Italy, there's a law that you can, I, I, you might have to fact check this, but as I understand it anyway, um, if you get, say you're on the unemployment dole and you get, I think you need 10 people to get together um, that are all on the dole, you can get, um, instead of having your, I think they pay your benefit for like three years or some limited time, instead of having that paid out on a weekly basis, if you get 10 people to agree to form a co-op together, they'll pay all of your unemployment benefit all in one lump sum so that you can use that as an investment in setting up a new wow. company. So you can be, you know, a building co-op or a cleaning co-op or a forestry co-op or whatever you're going to do with that. I mean, in the UK, it's not so much about cooperatives as it is about social enterprise, which is just the idea of a business that prioritizes positive social impact over profit. Um, and a lot of uh, their government procurement rules, so like as in, you know, when they... Um, when they're going to hire a caterer or a cleaner or, you know, stuff that government people have to pay for, they have to prioritise looking for a social enterprise over a traditional business. So it's really, I think that's quite an accessible um, place for legislation to change the shape of the marketplace and to prioritise um, positive impact over profit. This is my last question for you, and that's what advice do you give to a young developer or just even a young tech-savvy person who is interested in starting the next Lumio? The, you got to find friends, you know, um, people that are going to, um, cause it's really, it's like a, impossibly difficult and, um, uh, you can't do it on your own and, and you need to be continuously re-encouraged to keep, to keep slogging away. Um, and, and what's worked for us is just to be in a community. Like that's what Inspiral has played for us is this, this community of people that are all, um, yeah, engaged with this idealistic but quite pragmatic approach to changing the world through um, building good businesses and, and making good software. Thank you so much for talking to me today about this. This is a, I'm kind of at the beginning of this journey, starting to now consider um, the ways that initiatives and projects that I'm involved in can um, move towards being cooperative structures as well. And I've really enjoyed the, the learning opportunity. And thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing on this. Sweet. It's and for developing Lumio, because what an awesome legacy to come out of Occupy in New Zealand. Yeah, go Occupy, go hard. <laughs>